Beginning with reports by veteran federal investigators, we see that for 18 months preceding 9-11, Saudi intelligence agents harbored and supported the 9-11 hijackers in every conceivable fashion. We will learn how the operation was funded, how their handlers let the, let the lead of the hijackers to flight training on Boeing airliners in the Arizona desert, and how they devised an air attack that defeated the world's most sophisticated defense system, and skipping over... Suspiciously enough, the vice president's former corporation was well positioned to provide massive logistical services to 100,000 U.S. troops for a relatively quick deployment. He also fed America a stream of false intelligence about weapons of mass destruction and embellished links between Saddam Hussein and bin Laden during an urgent rush to war. Our guest for the remaining three hours of tonight's program is Captain Philip Marshall. We will get to him after a brief break. Please stand by. Sustained inverted flight will continue for the duration of the program on Coast to Coast AM. Without further ado, let us bring on to the bridge of the mothership the one, the only, Captain Philip Marshall. Welcome, sir. Hello, John. How are you tonight? I'm doing all right. I um, Your book is absolutely fascinating. It really is. It's so well written. It's it's very articulate and it's it's clever and it's and it's. And it's scary as hell. Uh, where would you like to start on this? Uh, car bombers did what? Or <laughs> this is this is some amazing stuff. And and I have just it's just one of those it's one of those works you just want to linger over because not only is it well written, but you can't believe what you're reading. So how were these novice pilots able to fly as competently as they did? Because I couldn't jump into the left seat any of these aircraft take a look at the POH and, and uh, do my thing. Uh, when we uh, when we talked earlier, I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, give me give me a basic idea of the controls. Let me look at the pilot's operating handbook for a minute. You go, well, look, here's the thing. When you shove those throttles forward, you better know what you're doing because that thing is going to take off like a rocket and you're not just going to be able to fly this thing like a little Cessna and just make it do what you want. This aircraft has to be managed. So how did these guys do this, and where did they receive their training, and who arranged that? Yeah, that was uh, that was the first thing that that really raised a red flag for me was when I put when when I got the NTSB reports and saw the flight patterns and I and uh, the the uh, black box recordings and all that are very very accurate and they all lined up you know to the to the half second, basically, with everything. So um, I put that together. Uh, I've got all the black box recordings uh, on my on my website so people can see, you know, they can go in there and look at it, especially airline. When airline pilots look at this thing, they go, holy, holy smoke, how in the world, you know, did they know how to do that, you know? So it's very obvious to me that they had a Boeing instructor and um, and Boeing airplanes, and th- there was no doubt about that. For instance, I tried to fly the pattern of American 77, the one that hit the Pentagon, and I flew it, um, you know, three three hundred miles three hundred miles to the west <laughs> is where this this Hani Hanjour, who was the the pilot. Uh, he was a Saudi guy from the same hometown as the the Prince Bandar, who was documented as funding this operation through the Riggs Bank. That's a that's a whole different story. But at any rate, he took the airplane from 300 miles west, made the perfect turnaround. Of course, that was a pretty easy one there because he was going west. So all he had to do is basically reverse course, you know, for for his navigation. Yep. Um, so then he came back into into Washington. He came over Dulles Airport uh, around nine thousand feet. Uh, he clicked the autopilot off at seven thousand feet, and you can see he kind of waved it a little bit. But that's to be. I, I mean, I can't imagine flying that airplane single pilot. You know, I rely on my co-pilot. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, you're, a, you're you're basically a two-headed. Four armed monster in the in 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 the cockpit of one of those airliners, and you're checking and cross checking, and you know we have all types of procedures that you know we're, we're watching each other. You can't you, almost doesn't cut it uh, in, in the airline business. You know, oh, I almost got to seven thousand feet. I love leveled off at six thousand. Yeah, well, that's great, but you just killed you know five hundred people. 
you know, it right. doesn't it, it doesn't cut it. Um, but at any rate, he he clicked off the autopilot at seven thousand feet, came over the, and coming right at the Pentagon. He had uh, he he too had National Airport locked in on his navigation. So on a beautiful day like that, he could pick up the target visually, and when he did that. Um, he came over the Pentagon. He was he was way high. He was at seven thousand feet, and, and the Pentagon's not that easy to spot really from the air. It's kind of spread out building, and there's a lot of other buildings in the in the area. It, it, you really have to know what you're looking for. And um, you know, he came down seven thousand feet, and he, and he did a a steep descending turn. And rolled out at 2,500 feet with the Pentagon in the wind in the windshield in front of him. Now, think about what was going on at that time. They just killed two pilots. It was a murder scene. It was chaos. It was. I, I can't even imagine trying to stay focused in in a situation like that. But this guy, you know, had the situational awareness to to roll out at 2,500 feet. And started diving towards the Pentagon, and and then he he pushed the throttles up to the firewall. Now, when I tried that in the simulator, <laughs> I, you know I'm a pretty big guy. I'm 220 pounds, six three, two twenty, something like that. I could not hold the yoke down because those engines produce something like sixty thousand pounds of thrust each. Yes. So, so that thing's climbing like a bat out of hell. So the only way, so I, I actually missed it on the first, I was a 1,000 feet and climbing when I went over it the first time in the sim. Um, it took me three tries to hit the, or four tries actually to hit the building. And the only way I could do that was to start trimming the nose down before I pushed the throttles up. So according to the official, or According to the intelligence community, let's say uh, this was this guy's first time in yeah. the cockpit of a seven fifty seven. Yeah, sure. I don't think so. So well, you, you know that leads me to believe that hey, somebody trained him. Hey, can I find any? Uh, can I find any evidence that you know someone trained them? Well, when I found the Congressional Joint Inquiry report. And learn that as soon as these guys hit the ground in Los Angeles on on January fifteenth, you know they were met by employees of the Saudi Aviation Authority. Really, and they were connected to a a, a company called Dalla Afco, which is a Saudi operator, kind of a contractor for the Saudi government that operates Boeing. Airplane, so that tells me right there. It's like, oh, there it is. <laughs> I found, I found, you know, where they, where they got instructors from, and I found out where they uh, got the manuals from, and the expertise that was needed to to fly this this particular mission. Uh, my next step was okay. Now I need to find an airport, and I need to find airplanes, <laughs> and. Um, all the reports, the FBI guys were following these guys out into this triangle out in, in Arizona. And I started looking around out there for, you know, they, they have these uh, storage airports. The, the banks, you know, own most of the airplanes that are leased by the airlines. And sometimes in between these leases, they're parked at these storage airports. And one airport really started to stick out. It had 757s and 767s parked on the field in the summer of 2001. Really? And it was a CIA airport from back in the Air America days. Um, so that really started to raise some red flags. And then on top of that, there was a, a um, the number three guy, who was appointed, number three got the CIA, who was appointed uh, by W on in, in June of 2001. His firm was the one that was placing all these bets, uh, uh, I'm sorry, trades, 
on the airlines that went down. He had put options on two airlines, or he didn't, but his firm did. So there was a connection there. Jeremy Scahill is a investigative author that wrote extensively about Pinal Air Base out there. And, um, you know, that's where these guys disappeared, too. That, that's where they were. That's where the FBI um, reported seeing them out in the Arizona desert. And at the same time, the head of the Saudi intelligence, the longtime guy, Prince Turkey Al Fazl, was in in the area. He was he was up in Las Vegas. He was in the same desert. Gotcha. With about a hundred guys that disappeared, or they flew out about a week after the attack. Understood. 